Acts of barbarism by ISIS have shocked and horrified the world over and only reinforced fears that those seeking to cement the caliphate are a force that cannot be stopped or negotiated with. Here now to share his perspectives, Robert Fisk, Middle East correspondent for The Independent, and we are happy to welcome you back to TVO. Thank you very much. You were much. here a few years ago. We're glad to have you here. Mm -hmm. You're in Canada, actually, for a um, seven-city, seven-lecture tour uh, called Goodbye, Mr. Sykes, Adieu, Monsieur Picot, How the ISIS Caliphate Frightens the Middle East and Us, which is a great title. But perhaps you could set up the discussion we're about to have by reminding everybody who Sykes and Pico were and why they're important to this whole thing. Mr. Sykes was a rather uh, foolish British politician uh, and regarded as such by the cabinet at the time, who with Monsieur Picot, uh, who was a, a, a French civil servant, in secret in Paris and London drew up during the First World War a map of the Middle East deciding which countries would effectively own which parts of the old Ottoman Empire, now the Middle East Arab world. The French were to get Syria and Lebanon, parts of northern Iraq. The British would get southern Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine. So in effect, immediately after the First World War, we went into action on the basis of Sykes and Pico. In fact, the French got Syria and Lebanon, Britain got all of Iraq, Jordan, Palestine. And the idea was that instead of giving immediate independence to the Arabs, which we'd promised, we would run these countries for them. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but would you say that what has transpired over the past hundred years all stems from what they did? Look. You can either start with the Bible, which I always find a rather boring document to read, or you can go to the Crusades, but I think if you're dealing with modern history, you've got to start with the modern Middle East, and that was Sykes-Pico. We had a series of promises made at that time. We had promises to the Arabs of total independence. We had the Belfort Declaration, promising, of course, the Jews that Britain would support a homeland, not a state, but a homeland for the Jews in, in Palestine. Palestine. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we promised two things to two people. We couldn't keep our promises. Promises are meant to be kept. We broke them both. Well, now we're dealing with ISIS. Yeah. And as your lecture points out, ISIS frightens not only us, but people in the Middle East as well. Of course. Why the Middle East too? Well, it's meant to frighten people in the Middle East because effectively what it's doing is saying goodbye to the nation state system over and above the, the ghastly murders and the wickedness of showing, let alone actually committing these executions on television. This is an institution, a cult I've called it, which is clearly intended to win not just by suicide bombing, but by fear. I mean, the real use of the word terror, which has become a cliche, actually, terrorist, terrorist, uh, you can see it with ISIS. Um, and I mean, I've been right the way down in the last, uh, some weeks ago, all the way down the Syrian government side of the front line in Syria, opposite. You can see the ISIS, you can see ISIS flags. And, you know, you only have to find, for example, that ISIS will go into a Kurdish village, find a militiaman who's been fighting with the Syrian government, He'll be taken out of the village. He'll have his throat cut on a videotape. And before they release the video to the Syrians or the world, they'll send a copy to the family to watch the execution of their own hmm. father or husband. But I've but also read in your pieces, hmm. though, that, that you've spoken to people who say, as long as you don't drink and as long as women dress modestly and you run your business and mind your P's and Q's, hmm. they'll leave you alone, too. It appears to. I've got Iraqi friends in Lebanon who travel to Raqqa, which is the Syrian version of the ISIS capital. Uh, every two weeks. And they say, as long as you don't mess with them and you don't work for the regime, don't smoke, don't drink, you can carry, you know, one of them is uh, selling washing machines in, in Raqqa mm -hmm. and comes back for new machines, take them from them. There are ways across the front line. In fact, there's a bus uh, that goes from the ISIS side to Damascus. You know, it's not quite as clear cut of, you know, bad guys and... Who runs that bus? A uh, guy in Raqqa, actually, and, and he has permission to do so. And I think he's paying taxes. Huh. There is a taxation system. There's even a garbage collection system. Uh, which ISIS has been advertising in Beirut because there's a garbage strike there. You can't right, collect your right. garbage, you see. Um, but let's not fool ourselves. You know, I ISIS is the most sinister institution. But what I've been trying to... I mean, I'm still not clear what ISIS is, to be honest. And this is the first time I've started a lecture series where I ask the audience as many questions as I try to give them answers. But the strange thing about ISIS is it is utterly cruel but utterly unemotional. I've never before in the Middle East come across a guerrilla force, or if you call it that, you know, militia army, which has no feelings. If you, you have some evidence of that well, in front of yeah. you. Well, uh, yeah. Just over a year ago, I was in the um, village of Yabrud in southern, uh, southern Syria, just north of Damascus. Oldest Christian church in Syria was there. I wanted to see if it had survived. The Syrian government army was just recapturing um, the city, and I went in with Syrian troops. It was smoke everywhere, shells falling. In the church, 
There were a list of, there were a whole series of mosaics outside the church in which the Nusra, uh, the allies of ISIS in this case, and ISIS, had gone around with drills, drilling out the eyes of all the saints in the mosaics. There was even a mosaic of St. George and the dragon, and they drilled out the dragon's <laughs> eyes. Oh, what has ISIS got against dragons, right? I mean, one, one has to have a sense of humor somewhere. Now, inside a sort of lady chapel, beside the church, I found piles of these paintings ripped up. I mean, a carpet high pile. They'd obviously ripped them systematically to destroy them. What was interesting was that this was clearly not torn at by a man with a knife saying, you know, Allah Akbar. This was fed into a machine. All these oil paintings of the saints. So what do you infer from that? Unemotional, they didn't care. They decided they would erase it. They didn't do so screaming infidel. They just said, this has to go. And you see, the point is the very first video they put out, this is ISIS, before we saw these terrible executions, the very first video, only shown in the Middle East, I saw it out there, was a, was a video of a bulldozer destroying a sand berm, you know, a cliff of sand, mm -hmm. which marked the original border between Syria and Iraq. And the camera panned down on a very poorly written piece of paper with biro saying, end of Sykes-Picot. They even know. They, oh, yes, they understood, exactly. <laughs> and that evening, actually, I was going out to dinner with Wally Jumblatt, the Druze leader in Lebanon, a very well-known intellectual politician. And he said, Robert, it's the end of Sykes-Picot. I said, oh, come on, Wally. Said, no, it is, he said. And since then, I've come to realize that I think, I mean, quite aside from ISIS, you know, the whole revolutions in 2011, I never called it an Arab Spring, but these revolutions, they represented not just a revolution against dictators, but they were primarily our dictators. The French supported Ben Ali. We loved Mubarak, and we still love Mr. Sisi. We support or We supported Saddam for a long time. Mm -hmm. For a period, Assad, uh, including Bashar al-Assad, the son, uh, was on our good list. And what's happening, in effect, is that these people are not just saying we reject dictators. They're saying, we reject the dictators and the kings which you Westerners put on us ever since Sykes-Picot. Is that the big difference between, I mean, you've covered wars in the Middle East for 40 years almost. Is that the biggest difference between the violence we've seen lately and stuff you've covered previously? Well, you see, the revolutions in the Arab world, I call it the Arab awakening. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they said, we will no longer take the Sykes-Picot history. Mm -hmm. Because after Sykes-Picot, the Arabs had no freedoms. In the revolutions, in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, we never saw anyone waving a banner asking for democracy because it was the Western democracies which were supporting Mubarak and all these other people. Mm -hmm. They asked for dignity and they asked for freedom and they asked for justice, you see. Did they're not they going to get any of the above? Well, they're not going to get justice through ISIS. They're not going to get dignity. Um, but interesting enough, the only ISIS video of Palestine we've ever seen, of the Palestinians, was not, it never made a comment when Israel bombarded of that bloody bombardment of Gaza last summer, they merely showed the burning of a Palestinian flag. Now, I noticed they that from your They wanted to get rid of Palestine because they wanted a caliphate. No countries, no nations. In a way, that's kind of merged with this idea that people out there now, I mean, I'm talking about the people of the Arab world, Muslim Arab world, they don't any longer believe in the nation state. And if you take this forward, um, Look at the 800,000 refugees, million refugees in Europe. They're crossing the borders. They don't recognize the frontiers anymore. Mm -hmm. It's over. You know, I said to one audience, I think it was, it was in Victoria, in Vancouver Island, I said, you know, I don't understand fully what's happening in the Middle East, but I've never seen anything like this before. Everything is changing. Wally Jumblatt was right. It probably was the end of Sykes-Picot. But it sounds like it's, if you're right, it's the end of more than that. It's the end of countries as we know it in this part of the world. Up to a point, probably, yes. Um, I mean, you know, we'll still go to Egypt and need a visa at the airport for the time being. But I think what's happened is that the, the old blocked-in idea that these borders were impermeable mm -hmm. and forever has finished. So what does the new caliphate that they have the long-range plan to create look like? I don't think this has anything to do with the caliphate. No. ISIS is a weapon. It's not an ideology. It's not an, well, it's a guerrilla army, but it is a weapon. The question is, who's holding the weapon? Who does it belong to? Now, what's happening, I think, at the moment, and I'll try and make this as brief as possible, is that after years and years and years of supporting the Sunni Muslim states, particularly the wealthy Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, a Wahhabi Salafist state, which, remember, in the case of Saudi Arabia, supported the Taliban. Osama bin Laden was a Saudi. 15 of the 19 hijackers, hijackers. were Saudis on 9-11. I think the Americans have decided that the Shia Muslim Iranian state 
might perhaps become again the policeman of the Gulf, as it was under the Shah of Iran. They've got a chance, they're going to try it. And I think the Saudis realise that the Shiites are now going to have America's favour, if, of course, Iran responds as America wishes. And in that case, Saudi Arabia and all those frightened Gulf, vulnerable, wealthy states are going to want to keep Shiism at bay. And this ISIS organization is primarily aimed not against the West, but against Shiism. I, if you look at ISIS, they will never criticize Saudi, Saudis. I'm not saying the Saudi government is handing checks over, no. But the money for, for ISIS is definitely coming from the Gulf. It's coming from Saudi Arabia, it's coming from Qatar. Uh, Nusra openly admits it's getting the support of Qatar. So I think what is happening, I think the Americans are moving across to the Shiites rather than the Sunnis. And in that case, ISIS is definitely a weapon. Does that suggest that the Americans are going to be cozying up to Iran even more in the future? I think one, yes. But two, I think they're going to try and get the Saudis to switch off ISIS. You know, there was this big conference on nuclear facilities in Iran, in Geneva. Success, according to the Americans and the Iranians. My understanding in Beirut and in Damascus is that much of that conference was taken up discussing Syria and ways of switching it off. Now we've got the Russians and the Americans and the Iranians and the Europeans. Assad is obviously going to be able to stay, for the time being at least. Philip Hammond, the British Defence Minister, in a strange press conference at the Foreign Office with, with Kerry the other day, suggested he would be staying. So mm -hmm. maybe Assad is going to survive after all. Um, I can see the makings of switching off the violence. Not, not peace in our time, forget that sort of mm -hmm. thing in the Middle East. But if that's the case, that will be a victory for Iran and a victory, of course, for America in that sense, if they stay with the Shias. And we'll see what happens to ISIS. The Saudis will have to be told, you really must switch it off now. Hmm. Let me get your take on something. Um, do you know Karen Armstrong, the author? She's got a book yeah, out called course, yes. Fields of Blood. She was formerly a nun, wasn't she? Yes. Yeah, indeed she was. And, and the view she takes in this book, a very 500-page uh, book, is that Small. <laughs> well, much of the world considers what's going on in the Middle East to be religious wars. Mm -hmm. She says not. These are not wars, in her view, in the name of religion. They are ISIS is as, as political an organization as the next one. Based on what you've seen and know, agree or disagree? Agree, yeah. Look, the idea that it's a sectarian war is very much a Western idea. Now, if you're a Shiite and you live in Baghdad, it'll make a lot more sense that it is a sectarian war. And there's no doubt that the executions, particularly of Shiites by Sunnis, they began in Baghdad ooh, two years after the American occupation. I remember seeing the bodies with that heads coming into the... I mean, it was, ISIS began years and years ago before it was ever called ISIS. But I think that this is about power in the Middle East and it's about post-colonial power. Because the days when, first of all, we occupied the countries, then we had our proxies, kings, and dictators, and then a kind of um, technocracy... But that's finished now, except perhaps in Egypt, which is a separate story. But I think that what we're seeing now is a complete change where it's not about sectarianism, it's about the use of power. You have to look at Lebanon, for example. Of all the countries in the world at the moment, you would have thought Lebanon would have fallen to bits. But it's one of the few countries in the Arab world that has not fallen to bits. Unless you want your garbage picked up. Well, unless you want your bar garbage picked up, and the fact that you don't have a president doesn't help, and the fact that your ca cabinet doesn't work, and we've now got nine hours of electricity cuts a day, mm -hmm. but it still works. The reason, I think, one is countries with histories continue. Countries without histories are always in danger. Iran's okay. Egypt's okay. Jordan's probably not. Saudi Arabia, poof. Lebanon's probably okay. Syria, in the end, will be. It's got a history. But overall, it's about the movement of power in the Middle East. Who is going to be favored in the post-colonial world? Hmm. Let's finish up on this then in our last minute here. You having watched all of this for almost four decades and you having reported on some pretty badass characters in this part of the world, hmm. that's not my first use of unparliamentary language, incidentally, in this question. We who, use worse. Who are the biggest bastards in the Middle East right now in terms of um, excessive use of, of awful power to get what they want? If you start counting out who's killed the most people, well, Saddam is somewhat lower than the Americans and the British in 2003. Uh, Palestinians have killed fewer Israelis and Israelis have killed Palestinians. But you can't do it like that. What you've got to do is to say, look, hold on a second. Who do the various 
power holders. What do they want to do and who are they working for? Are they working for America, Russia, Israel, Iran? Um, at the end of the day, we've got to wait to see a new series of leaders within the Arab world who emerge from the people. Not Well, NASA got close to it. Oddly enough, the only statesman I've ever come across in the Middle East was ex-President Hatami of Iran. He wanted a new, he wanted a civil society. He talked about it, and the Americans slapped him down, and we got that wretched man, Ahmadinejad. But you know, I'm not trying to equate different groups, but there are no good guys in the Middle East. Some are better than others, though. Some get elected. The problem is that the moment you start saying that, you're inviting people to join one side or the other, and it doesn't work. The Middle East is not uh, a game where you play neutral middleman. You, you can be, as a journalist, you should be neutral and impartial on the side of those who suffer. But it is not a football game. It is a bloody tragedy. And the people who are suffering suddenly are tired of it. They don't want to suffer anymore. So they had their revolutions, and now they decided they'll go to Germany. Hmm. Think about that. There's a lot to think about there. That's really quite something. Robert Fisk, we always appreciate uh, you making time for us when you visit. Uh... Sorry I don't have the right number of answers on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, that means we'll just have to have you back. Thank you. Robert Fisk from The Independent. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.